Hi, this is Shane Armand Rowe. There are plenty of great videos on the Anne Bernack RG351V out there. So let's try to break some new ground, and I'm going to show you 10 things you need to know about this great little emulation device. Stick around. It has remarkably good hardware for 100 bucks. If you've ever had the experience of buying too good to be true Chinese knockoff devices from places like AliExpress and eBay, you're familiar with the concept of being oversold by technology that usually doesn't live up to the promises and is rarely worth what you paid for it. Unlike those devices, the Anbernic from a hardware standpoint alone is worth the hundred bucks. There are plenty of videos and websites to discuss the internals, so let's look at some of the hardware features that are usually left wanting by other devices. Let's start with the screen. Unlike so many other devices, this 3.5 inch IPS screen is 4x3 orientation, much like the original tube TVs we used to game on back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I am a big fan of widescreen orientation on my devices, but in the case of the Anbernic, it makes complete sense as this device best emulates the machines we used to play on televisions and computer systems that used 4x3 monitors. We're not watching movies on this thing, nor are we playing modern game consoles, so this aspect ratio is a real winner. The screen is bright, easy to read, and looks far better in person than you're likely to see in videos. My biggest boggle with most of these cheap devices are the controls. For some reason, manufacturers have forgotten how to make a good D-pad. Anbernic's D-pad is great, not mushy, not clicky, and it works well in four directions, as well as dual directions to perform eight-way functions. On the front face buttons, your main four buttons are darn near perfect. They aren't squishy, nor do they feel too clicky. I love them, and that says a lot. The analog stick is refreshingly quality as well. It feels solid, acts as an R3 click button, and doesn't feel like it will break off in a month. If I had to complain about it, I'd say it's set a bit low on the unit to enjoy for long periods of time. Still, there are some great uses for it, including games that use analog sticks and for computer systems where a mouse emulator is useful. As a bonus, it works great for spinner-type arcade games like Tempest or even games such as Time Pilot. Rounding out the face buttons is a function button and the start and select buttons. While none of them are poor, the start and select buttons are definitely a small step down from the awesome four face buttons. Fortunately, you're not going to be using them very often, so it isn't too bad of a letdown. The weakest controls are on the back, where we have two shoulder buttons on each side, none of them qualifying as triggers. And that's okay, because the games this machine plays best don't need triggers per se. They are highly clicky, but are responsive. After the insane good face buttons, these are just a bit jarring, but they do their job. They may seem incredibly uncomfortable in terms of placement, but oddly enough, they're not as bad as they seem. Again, these are filler buttons for most of the systems we're emulating, and even for those that need them, like Super Nintendo, they appear to work great. Inside, we have reliable 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi, and believe me, you will be using it, and a reasonably sized 3900 mAh battery, which will give you somewhere around 6 hours of play. I will admit the battery lasts a lot longer than I thought it would, and being down with COVID on the family couch, I spent many long hours playing with it. What isn't great are the cheap generic SD cards that come with the system. You'll get a 16 gigabyte and a 64 gigabyte card in this thing, and they are not brands you're gonna wanna rely on. Building the cost of replacing these cards with a quality 16 and 128 gigabyte SanDisk or similar set of cards, you may even consider imaging the original SD cards the day you open it, just in case something terrible happens to them before you replace them. While usable out of the box, it's really designed for tinkerers. Yes, as promised, this device comes ready to run with 10,000 games. And yeah, this is true. It isn't 100 copies of Super Mario Brothers and 200 copies of Street Fighter here. These are all pirated games that cross dozens of systems. I don't know legally how they are getting away with it, but you can be sure that there will be plenty to try out the moment you turn it on. Where this stops being a mall kiosk toy and becomes the true powerhouse it is, starts when you pull these cards out and start putting your own content on there. In many cases, it's as easy as popping a few ROMs from your own collection in particularly named folders, but when you start getting into complicated emulation like Daphne or PC game ports like Open Tyrion and Quake, you are going to need some technical expertise. 
If you want your own content to look as good as the stuff that was included, you're going to need to set up an account on a popular game media scraping service and work that into your unit. Now we could go on and on about some of the other hurdles you might encounter, but you get the idea. Once you leave the safe world of what is provided, expect to roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. It emulates most systems up to the early 90s, with a few exceptions. We often talk about generations of game consoles, starting with Generation 1 in the late 70s with things like the Magnavox Odyssey and the Fairchild Channel F. As we move through the generations, we see Generation 2 with Atari 2600 and Television, ColecoVision, and others. The Anbernic covers well the systems that make up the first four generations and effectively peaking out at the Sony PlayStation 1 released in 1995. Other fifth generation consoles like Nintendo 64, Atari Jaguar, 3DO, Sega Saturn do not perform well on the Anbernic, although with a lot of fooling around, some games may run well enough to play. I would honestly call this system done with the Sony PlayStation 1. As computer systems go, you'll find those alive during the time frames mentioned to perform quite well. The Amiga ECS chipset machines like the Amiga 500 and 2000 games overall play very well. But the Amiga AGA chipset games from the Amiga 1200, Amiga CD32, and 4000 are largely unplayable to me. As with the other Generation 5 consoles, it will vary from game to game, but I would say Amiga ECS is where this emulation station ends its life. Handhelds have an amazing representation on this device, and not just the ones you think either. Sure, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Atari Lynx, and many others work even better than they have any right to, including neat things like Super Game Boy support, bezels, and more. But what you may not realize is that many handheld games like Game & Watch, Tomy Tron, Dungeons & Dragons LCD, and dozens more like them can be played on Anbernic. The newest handheld you might expect to get some quality play out of is the Sony PlayStation Portable, but do not expect God of War or other later games to run well. Along with Sony's outing, Nintendo's offering, the venerable Nintendo DS, does not perform well at all either, and I would not consider it a selling point of the unit. It has some very interesting hardware features. In this day and age, you really have to differentiate yourself if you want to be seen. The Anbernic looks like typical AliExpress fare, but there are a couple of neat things I'd like to highlight here. First, it has two micro SD or trans flash slots. This allows you to have a system SD card in the top slot and your ROMs and metadata in the other. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Speaking of doubling up, on the bottom of the unit are two USB-C plugs, not only for charging, but plugging in other devices, like flash drives, keyboards, other controllers, and more. I use it for transferring a big ROM set without having to rely on the slower 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi or having to eject the card and pop it in my PC. The best part about having two is that no matter what you need a USB-C port for, you can always charge it at the same time. A rare treat indeed. Another thing worth mentioning here is the well-done standby or sleep mode. Tapping the power button will put the unit into standby, leaving the power light on to show you the battery power levels. This mode allows for very long standby periods with very little power drain. Now this is the sort of thing we've come to expect from modern handhelds, but are rarely treated with this on cheap emulation units. You can leave it on overnight and expect to wake up with plenty of juice to spare. Finally, while the battery lasts a good long time, it is possible for mere mortals to open the unit and replace the battery with something slightly beefier to get another couple hours of play. This video from Retro Game Core shows the 3900 milliamp battery being replaced with a 4000 milliamp battery. This replacement costs 15 bucks, and it's nice to see the ability to change this thing out without needing to break the entire system down to get to it. There are multiple operating systems available. Many gaming units, like this one, use a fixed operating system that may occasionally get updates, such as those based on Android OS. Many handhelds like this never get operating system upgrades, and instead only benefit from the emulator upgrades themselves to improve the product over time. Sure, there are some systems like the Raspberry Pi that allow you to choose your own OS based on the SD card you put in. But thanks to the unique design of the Anbernic having two SD card slots, you can truly have an easy separation of operating system and content, meaning you can keep your ROMs and metadata media on the bottom card while swapping out for another operating system in the top slot. No more using a flash drive to keep your OS and content separate. 
The RG351V has numerous operating systems to choose from, the stock MU Elec OS, Arc OS, and the community favorite 351 Elec, which is what I use on my Anbernic unit. They all use the same basic components, but the polish and some features may vary from OS to OS. It is safe to say that very few people stick with the stock OS and choose to either go with Arc OS or 355 Elec. 351 Elec seems to be getting a lot of love and updates with a lot of community support. I personally like the way the options are all integrated in the overall polish of the OS. Everything seems to work as it should and everything seems to be where I would expect it to be. The best part is, you really don't have to choose. Just create your own boot SD cards for each OS and most, if not all, of your content on the second SD card will be picked up and work fine with little to no tinkering. This gives you the best of all worlds without compromise. Remote access from your PC or phone. Once you have the device 100% configured the way you want, including all the games and media, there may be very little value in being able to easily access this device via the network using a PC, phone, or tablet. But one thing I found over time is we're never really 100% done tinkering with these things, and being able to use an external device with a good file manager and web browser is a huge benefit. The built-in 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi may seem slow, but we're usually talking about very small ROM sets here. Using your PC with a quality file manager like Directory Opus here allows you the comfort of a familiar environment to download ROMs, disk images, and other files while seamlessly dropping them into your Anbernic SD card remotely. Being down with COVID, I relied on my phone to give me the power to curate my ROMs, then transfer them over with a great file manager like Explorer here. The methods you can connect and access files varies from OS to OS, but on 351 Elec, you're able to use SSH and Samba. Others may offer standard FTP access as well. But regardless of what method you use, the ability to easily and effectively access your file system on the Anbernic is a real winner and totally worthy of a mention in this video. It is perfect in almost every way for Gen Xers. As a Gen Xer myself, I truly appreciate this unit for many reasons. First, it plays the games I desperately want to play, those of the 70s and 80s. Classic arcade games, Commodore 64, VIC-20, Amiga, ColecoVision, and Television, these were all the staples of mine during my formidable years. Second, the screen being 4x3 really offers up a good experience for most of these games that I want to play. Sure, in some cases, the video presentation can seem matted, such as with the vertically oriented arcade games like Puyam, and sometimes you'll have some stretching in odd situations, but overall, this thing was built with Gen X in mind, and I can't get enough of it. Plus, for those of us growing up with the Game Boy form factor here, we are right at home and truly comfortable holding and using this device. If you're concerned with the form factor being uncomfortable after using wider, more landscape devices like the Sony PlayStation Portable or Vita, relax. This thing is light and comfortable for long-term use. I say perfect in almost every way because there are some exclusions that make me a sad panda. Namely, the poor playback of Amiga's Advanced Graphic Architecture, or AGA games, as they made up a good portion of my gameplay back in the 90s. Other systems that Gen X moved through, such as Nintendo 64 and maybe Nintendo DS, are also underperformers, which is unfortunate, but there is so much to play here that it's hard to ding the unit for those systems, especially at the ridiculous price point of 100 bucks. Features retro achievements which breathe new life into retro video gaming. Retro achievements have been around for a long time. Much like the achievement or trophy system of consoles, classic gameplay through certain emulators and through certain retro arch cores can be tied to a global online database that allows you to earn achievements for playing these old games. You merely make an account on retroachievements.org, enter your credentials in the Anbernak menus, and play compatible games noted by little trophy icons. They may or may not appear depending on your OS and theme support. As you play, when you perform the requested evolutions, like reaching a certain level, rating a certain score, or performing a certain task, a notice appears in the upper left corner letting you know you've earned it. This is communicated back to the server over Wi-Fi, and you can view achievements and even compare them to your friends that are also participating. It also allows optional presence sensing so your buddies can see what you're playing and vice versa. There are even leaderboards. 
Now, not every emulation core supports it. For example, the MAME cores do not, nor does every game have achievements. But you can play arcade games using FB Neo's core in RetroArch and get game achievements for arcade games. And more games are being added every single week to the collection of enabled games. Of course, if you're a savvy developer, you can even create your own achievements and share them with the world. It's easy to dismiss this as some sort of gimmick, but having just started dabbling in them, I assure you this really does bring some new life to the retro emulation scene. I only wish I'd taken them a little more seriously sooner. Configurable almost to a fault. How can having configuration options possibly be a bad thing? Well, when there are so many of them that it gets overwhelming. I mentioned the OS configuration options, but each one has theming options as well. Now, honestly, I've been rather disappointed with the themes by and large, as they all seem to have some type of oversight that the purist in me revolts against, like having Donkey Kong representing Commodore 64. But nothing is stopping me from cloning that theme and doing something else with it and sharing that with others. But the options don't stop with basic theme and visuals. Every system has configuration options. And within those configuration options, the emulator cores used can often be chosen from a list of options. Each of those cores could then in turn have more options available. And you can even take those options down to the game level. Whew. Fortunately, leaving options set at automatic will often produce great results, but understand that you're likely gonna be called upon at some point to peel back the onion layers and get your hands dirty if you want the best display and performance for a handful of outlier games that just don't play nice out of the box. Huge community and lots of support. Even the technically best devices out there end up stagnating and fizzling out without having a strong community to keep developing for it and helpful, excited power users to help support it on forums like Reddit and Twitter. YouTube channels like Retro Game Core and Busy Subs on Reddit show that the community loves this device, and they are more than happy to help others with videos, guides, public forum assistance on just about any issue. The fact that there are several active operating systems being worked on and supported for the Amberdick is a good, healthy sign of the ecosystem. Finally, the fact that these units are readily available at a great price point, sold and shipped from the good old USA, means that more people have access to them, allowing for more mass adoption than one of these Chinese knockoffs that you often have to wait weeks or even months to get. And once you do, there isn't a ton of support for it outside some YouTuber influencer videos talking about just how great it is. Anbernick has made a name and community for itself, and that can only be a good thing. I hope you enjoyed this 10 Things You Need to Know video and maybe picked up a few things that those other great videos didn't show you. Like, subscribe, hit the bell, get notifications of future videos. I'm Shane Armandro, and as always, thanks so much for watching and take care.